God is worthy of our thanks, would you agree? Amen. Amen. Yes, he is. Well, uh, happy Independence Day. Anybody thankful that they live in the United States of America this morning? I know I am. I'm going to go ahead and start us off in the book of Proverbs. I won't ask you to turn there, but I'm just going to read you one verse. It comes to us in Proverbs 14, verse 12. It says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You know, when a man, woman, or child makes the decision to gather up wisdom on how they should govern their thoughts, their emotions, or their actions, more often than not, when it's a complete decision upon themselves without any consultation of, of God, it always ends in a less than desirable result. Human beings are inherently prone to, I, I guess you could say, make determinations that fall outside the scope of favorable or even desirable. In short, let me say it this way. People do stupid things. Can I get an amen? amen. I, I can say that I've done stupid things. Can I get an amen? amen? You're supposed to say for you, not for me. <laughs> we can trace, by the way, this deep-rooted human flaw all the way back to the beginning, right? All the way back to Adam and Eve, who were given clear instructions on what they could do and what they couldn't do. And by the way, what they could do far outweighed what they were prohibited from doing. Amen? Yet human beings still decided to operate outside of that divine framework instituted by God and ended up bringing about a curse upon the human race and the earth in its entirety. Therefore God, the wonderful and tremendous God that He is, God recognizing the inability of human beings to live a just, in righteous existence, provided a way by which all men, women and children, could be restored to their previous position as being true children of God. Is anybody thankful for that this morning? That way which was provided was Jesus Christ. And sadly, there are so many, far too many, that reject that way. History has taught us that men and women continue to make the same mistakes which took place in the Garden of Eden. The system which has been designed to work well has been polluted by the iniquitous ambitions of human beings. Once again, when a human is left to their own devices, we somehow mess things up over and over again. We don't just see that throughout history. In, in far times past, but we can even see it today within our own country. All of a sudden, those words which we uh, celebrate today, those words which were signed and adopted in 1776, are being questioned, and, and, and in some cases, even outright defamed. Today, we celebrate the signing of the Declaration of Independence. But now, there are a growing number of Americans who say that this is not a cause for commemoration. And I have to ask myself this. Since when does honoring statements like we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, when did words like that become problematic for human beings? How can you poke holes by saying God has given you the chance at life, at liberty, or that's synonymous with freedom, and the pursuit of happiness? Now there is no doubt, and let me make this perfectly clear. There is no doubt that as you look back over our country's history, that we can point to times when people have made grave errors. Amen? We have made terrible judgment calls, but once again, just like the terrible judgment call that was made in the Garden of Eden by Adam and Eve, we see it play out over and over again. The people of this nation have adopted egregious policies and at times have even operated and conducted ourselves in an appalling manner. However, 
That does not mean that men being created equal and being given indefeasible rights is somehow cause to be disparaged and to be vilified. And with all that said, understand this. I am still one of those people who will proudly stand up in front of anybody and say, I am proud to be an American. Am I alone? I am thankful that God has blessed me by allowing me to be born in this great country. And at this point, you might be asking, Brother Danny, what in the world does this have to do with God? Because after all, we're in his house this morning. Amen? Well, just as the drafters of the Declaration of Independence wrote, and just as the framers of the Constitution wrote out a form or outlined a form of government that would steer our republic in a way that would be the right direction, and at times maybe need some, a little bit of course correction, human beings find a way to mess things up. Good things. We find a way to mess things up. And there is no difference from that to, the, to, to when it comes to the grace of God. Because you know what? We can mess that up too. You see, we can find in God's word the idea of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's written throughout. That description goes far past any document drafted by any framers of government. And instead, it provides us the way to live a life that is peaceful and honoring to God. And that's what I want to talk to you or talk with you about this morning. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to scroll or turn with me to a, a set of scriptures that's probably going to be preached in pulpits across the, the nation this morning. Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to begin our reading in verse 1. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. And when you get there, let me hear you say amen. Is anybody happy to be in church this morning? All right, I believe some of you. Galatians 5, verse 1, God's word says this. Stand fast, therefore, in liberty, wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the law, or to the whole law, rather. Christ has become of no effect unto you, Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, uh, but faith which worketh by love. Ye did run well, who did hinder that, or you that ye should not obey the truth. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven... Leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment. Whosoever he be, we're, we're in verse 11. And I, brethren, if yet I preach, or if I yet preach, whosoever he be, and I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would they were even cut off which trouble you. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not that liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The title of the message this morning is clear, cut, and simple. He set me free. Will you pray with me? Father God, I am thankful this morning that you have given me the strength and the ability to come to your house and worship you. Father, I'm thankful that there are other people that are here this morning to do the exact same. Father, I am thankful for this wonderful country that you blessed me with having the privilege to be born into, to grow up, and live in. Father, I am thankful for the men and women who sacrificed so much to provide the freedoms in which we have here today. But chiefly, I am thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ who provides freedom beyond this world, but rather provides us a way to get to heaven. 
Father, I am thankful this morning for all the provisions in which you placed before me. Father, I am thankful for all the blessings that you bestow upon me. And Father, this morning I pray this prayer. That if there is someone in here that is burdened in any way. Father, whether they know you and follow you or whether they do not. Whether they just have an understanding of you and not a relationship. Father, I pray this day by the reading of your word and by the ministry of the Holy Spirit that their burdens will be cast down. That their doubt will be eliminated. And Father, I pray that they seek you out this day. Father, I pray this morning that if there's anyone in the house that does not know you, that this will be the day that they recognize that they are in the yoke of bondage and need to be freed from enslavement. And Father, I pray for the Christian this morning who may be burdened with legalism, who may be burdened with self-doubt, who may be burdened with self-reliance. I pray this is the day that those shackles are freed from them as well. I pray that they take that step of faith to surrender all to you. And Father, it's in Jesus' name I pray all of these things. Amen. Some years back, Crystal and the kids and I went to uh, the Richmond Science Museum. Anybody ever been there? A couple of people, yeah? Uh, they had this exhibit, this whole wing, and they might still have it, I don't know, that was dedicated to nothing but speed. Now, anybody who's tried to keep up with me when they drive, knows that I like speed, okay? I, I try not to speed too much. But they had this, this wonderful exhibit, and they, they had a, a couple of different ways that they tried to, to show you how speed is calculated and how it can be tracked and measured. They had this, this exhibit where you could run and, and see how fast you can run. Now, I didn't like that as much because there was a snail that went by that was tracking faster than I was, Amen. They had this exhibit where you could throw a baseball and, and see how fast you could throw the ball. They had an exhibit where you could hit an air hockey puck to see how fast that it would go. But the best part of this area in the Science Museum for me wasn't any of that. It was this small little booth. It might not be small to some of you, but it was very small to me. If you do remember them, you don't see them too much anymore, but they were, they were almost as small as a telephone booth. And when you stepped inside of this, what it was was a hurricane simulator. It was a, it was a device that would start blowing uh, uh, air, probably no harder than a regular box fan that you could buy at a dollar store. But after some time, that air would in, intensify. And as that wind increased, it, you would see this meter on the side that would rise up to show you how many miles per hour that wind was blowing. So here I am. Not even thinking about the fact that I don't, you don't have to sign a liability waiver to get into this thing. You, there's no pads down. They're not making you wear helmets. They're, let, they're letting little kids go in this thing, for God's sake, right? But here I am. I get in this little booth, and I'm like this. And I'm just waiting. My hand's pressed because I know that this wind is going to get so hard that it's going to blow me over. But I stand there, and I, I see it steadily increase, and I believe the highest it got to, was 70 miles per hour. And as I stood there watching that meter go up, I guess I was expecting the wind to go get so harsh that it would knock me off my feet. Now, there I stood, almost in a fighting stance, to prop myself from what? From falling. And why was I doing that? Because I was expecting for that wind to be powerful enough to cause me to lose my balance. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, God's Word tells us to do what? To stand fast. Therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. The first thing I want to bring to your attention this morning is those first two words. Stand fast. Those can also be translated, by the way, as stand firm. Now, now why did I tell you about the hurricane simulator? Well, because we need to understand that if we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, if we have put our faith and reliance in Him, if we've put our trust in Him, if we have made Him the Lord of our life, we need to understand that we need to stand fast. We need to stand firm in that 
reality. We need to be prepared for that reality. Just like I was there standing waiting for that wind to blow me, well, that's funny, blow me out of the, the, the hurricane simulator, we need to stand fast in the Lord Jesus Christ. The grace that is given, which only emanates from the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord. The Christian, understand this, if you're a Christian this morning, you were not burdened down by obligatory religious observations such as ceremonies or, or endless symbolic ritual. That's not applicable to you. The Christian is not compelled to adhere to complex dietary laws. That's not something that you're required to, to, to follow. Now, understand this. Modern day Christianity is not plagued by these Jewish type customs as here in the, the church in, in Galatia. Because here he's speaking of, of circumcision, which was a requirement in order to have a relationship established with God. We're not arguing about things like this anymore. However, there is still the ever-present problem of enslavement to unneeded ritualism. A lot of times, by the way, we just call that unneeded ritualism tradition. Amen? John Barry points out this. He says, Paul uses, or Paul's use, rather, of the word slavery and freedom echoes the story of Exodus. When God delivered Israel from the Egyptians through a series of mighty deeds, he led them out of the wilderness to make a covenant with them. God saved them without them or without their obedience to his law, as the law had not yet been given. Soon after, however, the people began to complain about God's provision and leadership. Some even pleaded, and we talked about this uh, uh, about three or four weeks ago, and I even believe Brother Curtis mentioned this in one of his messages last week. They even pleaded and contemplated going back to Egypt. Going back to the place where they were in bondage. Going back to the place where they were slaves. Because of their ingratitude and their disobedience, God allowed a generation of Israelites to wander and die in the wilderness. Now, folks, too many followers of Jesus refuse to dig their hills in and stand firm in the fact that Christ has done all of the heavy lifting. Amen? There is nothing of yourself that is required short of faith, reliance, and trust. There are no check marks that you must fill. There are no hurdles that you must conquer in order for you to be saved. You simply have to place your faith and trust in Jesus. In our text this morning in the book of Galatians, we see that they have reverted back to Jewish customs and traditions. Not because they liked to observe them. Not because they wanted to feel some sense of what their ancestors did. But because they were relying once again upon these archaic traditions in order to be right with God. They had gone back to the law. So many Christians, and perhaps this morning, you may even be one of them, revert back to thinking that you yourself, with your own might and your own ability, has to be a good, quote-unquote, good person. And we understand that God's Word tells us that there are none are righteous. No, not one. God is going to look at me more favorably if I do this or, or don't do that. God, uh, God will make sure I get to work on time if I listen to Christian music on the way. Amen? Instead of country music or rock or whatever it is. Joe, you seem like a rap type of guy to me. The Galatians, and a lot of us for that matter, have either not fully realized or failed to remember that because of Jesus' death, we are righteous, unaccompanied by any requirement to fulfill the law or to conform to any tradition. That's what true freedom looks like, brothers and sisters in Christ. Not being required to do a checklist of things in order to be right with God. 
The Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 17 says this, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 9, God's word says, And be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. You see these things over and over again. Faith, grace, truth. It doesn't say, eat this way. It doesn't say, uh, 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 cut your body this way. It doesn't say all these things. No, it says what? Have faith in Jesus Christ. That is the requirement. Attempting to stick to the law as the church at Galatia was doing or thinking that there are certain traditions or stipulations for you to remain within God's favor or under His grace is a tragedy which undermines the sole reason for Jesus' presence upon this earth. Do you understand that? Any time that the thought crosses your mind that you are obligated to do something so that God will look at you better, it undermines the fact that Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross and shed His blood. Why? Because that blood was shed for the atonement of your personal sin. There is no more requirements to be right with God. Can somebody say amen? We undermine that fact Anytime we feel as if it's necessary for us to do something more so that God will give us grace. Being bound by Old Testament law or modern day church customs is nothing but another form of idolatry. Worshiping something other than Christ who came and died to make us free, to give us liberty. A lot of people... And I'd say maybe even some in here this morning. Watch your toes. I wash my own. Some of us worship the pew which we sit in. Think I'm wrong? Sit in a seat where a person always sits and sits there for years. And watch their face when they walk in and see you sitting there. They won't say anything to you. They may even smile at you and find somewhere else to sit. But there is that moment of the audacity of those people to sit in my seat. You know what they're thinking. A lot of people worship the kind of music that is sung at the beginning of a worship service or the, the number of songs sung. I, I see some of the faces and I hear some of the groans where Brother Max say, oh no, stand back up. We got one more song to sing. Poor, so everybody left Sister Carrie sitting on the stage last week uh, during revival. The, the singers were done singing. Carrie had to remind them to come back up. Some people worship the kind of clothes that are necessary to wear in order to worship God. I had a brother tell me in the last couple of weeks, he made it a point to say, you know what, uh, I'm going to be coming from work to Wednesday night Bible study. Is that okay? And I said, as long as you're wearing clothes, I don't care what you wear. Amen? I said, you'll find everything from suits to shorts in this church because I'm just, I'm just the type of guy that thinks that, you know what, the blood of Christ can cover murder and adultery and, and, and thievery. He can cover anything else, even if wearing a certain type of clothing was a sin, which it's not, by the way. As long as it's modest and appropriate. Let me, let me put that caveat out there. Don't run up to me after church. Some worship the preacher that is in the pulpit. And think I'm wrong. I, I've been guilty of it. I know I, I shared this with you some years back, but... There was, a, there was a, a, a pastor of Calvary Chapel in Fort Lauderdale, Florida some years back who, who I just thought was the most amazing preacher ever. His ability to articulate and communicate the gospel was, was second to none. My world, I was, I, I was younger in my faith, my world was shattered when I found out that he had fell into sin, resigned his position, and no longer served in the ministry. I was worshiping that pastor. I was worshiping the God in which he was preaching about. It broke my heart a couple of years ago when all these accusations came out about the apologist Ravi Zacharias after he passed away. And it just broke my heart. But I noticed, and I'm not, I'm not bragging on me, this is a God thing, I noticed the difference. With Bob Coy, it caused me to ask myself questions. I wasn't going to say his name. I didn't want to say, people say I was gossiping or backbiting. When that pastor in Florida stepped down, it caused me to ask myself questions uh, about faith that I'm embarrassed to say to you right now. 
because I recognized that I wasn't worshiping God when I, when I was listening to his sermons and hearing his messages. I liked the way he communicated. When Robbie Zacharias, I found out about him, you know what? It was heartbreaking because he was just such a great, great communicator of the gospel. But the fact is, he's a human being. And as I mentioned before, human beings always find a way to do stupid things. Amen. We always mess up a good thing, even God's grace. In the book, The Wounded Healer, Arthur Henry Newman retells a tale of ancient India. And it talks about four royal brothers. Understand, this is allegory. It talks about four royal brothers who decided that they each were going to master a special ability. So time went by and the brothers met to reveal what they had mastered. One said, I have mastered science. That was the first one. By which I can take but a bone of some creature. And you know what? I can take that bone from that creature and I can create the flesh that goes with it. The second said, okay. Know how you can, you can grow a creature's skin from nothing but a bone? Well, I'm able to create its limbs if I have flesh and bone, skin and hair. The fourth said, okay. Know how you can, the first one can create flesh and the next one creates skin and hair and the next one can create limbs? I can give it life. That's my special ability. And thereupon the brothers went into the jungle and what they did is they went to find a bone so that they each could demonstrate their abilities. Once again, remember this is a metaphor, it's allegory, right? As fate would have it, the, the bone they found was a lion's bone. One added flesh to the bone, the second grew hide and hair, the third completed it with matching limbs, and the fourth gave that lion life. Hmm. That lion being awakened, shaking its mane, the ferocious beast arose and jumped on his creators. He killed them all and vanished contently into the jungle. Now why am I telling you this metaphor about four brothers who claimed that they had special abilities to bring a creature to life? Well, because of this. That, 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 that lion killed its creators and went into the jungle. We too have the, the capacity to create things which will do nothing but devour us. Just like that lion tearing apart those four brothers. We have the ability to conjure up things which bring nothing but more wickedness, more iniquity, and more sinfulness. Can I get an amen? And I'll tell you how. Idolatry. Tradition, relying on our own ability to do that which we think is righteous, can all consume us. Unless we first seek God's kingdom and righteousness and remember our very freedom comes from nothing within ourselves, but instead comes directly from Jesus. Second point I have for you this morning is you have a choice. Still after the point in which you have decided to follow Jesus Christ. You have the choice to trust in yourself or to fully trust Jesus. In the book of Galatians, the church was going back to a, attempting to observe the law. For their righteousness, as, as, as Max Anders writes, those who return to the law face several Negative consequences, and I'll spend the next couple of minutes as we close out going over those consequences that are outlined in Galatians chapter 5. I'll start with verse 2. It says, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Understand, brothers and sisters, this morning, take out, and I want to add, take away or add to God's word, but I want to put in the context what this is saying to us. Here, that, that if ye be circumcised, let's, let's put in there, if you're relying upon your ability to do anything to gain favor from God, Christ shall profit you nothing. There is no reason to proclaim His name. There is no reason to say you're a Christian. There is no reason for you to pray in His name. Because if you are relying upon yourself to do anything which is divinely needed, Christ profits you nothing. In verse 2 we see that trying to 
observe the law, negates Jesus' work on the cross. God's Word says that by submitting to circumcision for spiritual purposes, Jesus is of no usefulness to you. The same for us if we're doing anything to try to work or gain our admittance to that celestial kingdom. Christ is of no benefit to us. Because you are relying upon your own abilities instead of depending on the sufficiency of Him. Verse 3 tells us, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. Make sure you don't miss that. The whole law. In verse 3 we see that if we're depending on the observance of one law, then we are obligated to every single one of them. Do you know how many laws, by the way, this morning, how many people would call themselves a, a student of the Bible? Thank you, a couple. Guys, you've got to get in the Word. That, that, that breaks my heart as a pastor. I think we're just going to go ahead and get on the altar real quick. We're done. Let's wrap this service up. We know what we need to pray for this morning. How many people have been in the faith, followed Jesus Christ for more than five years? Ten. Fifteen. Twenty. Twenty-five. All right, you can put your hands down because I feel like you're going to think I'm picking on you. So we have people, a majority of people that have been a follower of Jesus Christ for 25 years. So in God's word, let me ask you a question. Do you know how many laws are weaved throughout the Old Testament scriptures? Six, how much? It's close. Good job, brother. Anybody else? 613. There are 613 commandments. We'll compare notes. 613 commandments. I would venture to guess that most people didn't even know that number. I wouldn't have known unless I looked it up. Don't make me stand up here like I'm holier than thou. I know the word so well. I knew how many, how many commandments were in the Old Testament. Most people don't even know that number, let alone know every law in which they would have to adhere by. And if you don't know how many there are, and you can't sit here and quote them, how in the world can you obey them? It's almost as bad as the laws that they pass in the Commonwealth of Virginia. You know how many laws have come to pass since January 1st of this year? A lot. And most of us wouldn't be able to quote them, but they become useless at that point. But that's going to take us down a whole other road. Let's get back to God's Word. Galatians chapter 5, verses 4 through 6. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Understand this, verses 4, 5, and 6 show us that returning to the law or returning to self-reliance removes that person from God's grace. Understand, when you try to take it upon yourself to do anything, within your own will and your own might, without relying upon Jesus Christ, removes you from the very grace that was extended to you by the shedding of His blood. While the legalist is insecure because he cannot know if he has done enough to merit salvation, the believer is secure because he has placed his faith in Christ and will eagerly await Righteousness. Not righteousness of himself, but righteousness because all God can see is the blood of Jesus which has blotted out every transgression and every sin. Verse 7. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord, that ye will be none otherwise minded. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. Verses 7 through 10 tell us that returning to the law or relying upon ourselves to be righteous hampers ours and others' spiritual growth. 
You understand by not relying upon God, you're basically saying that you have no reason for Him. You do not have a, a, a relationship that, that's required. And if you don't have a relationship, how in the world can you grow closer to Him? Now we can easily put that in the context of human relationships, right? If you're married and, and you don't, and you don't uh, uh, communicate with that person, uh, you don't desire to spend time with that person, you don't have fellowship with that person, after a while you're going to grow apart, amen? And that relationship becomes strained. The same way with God. This metaphor used by Paul of the leavened bread describes how only a small portion, a tiny bit of self-righteousness or legalism can corrupt not only the individual believer, but an entire church. And all it takes is a little bit. That little bit of leaven. Leaveneth the whole lump. Verse 11. And I, brethren, if, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then as the offense of the cross ceased, I would they were even cut off which trouble you. There is an obvious division as we read these scriptures. There is an obvious division within this church. As some blaming Paul of deviating from Jesus' teachings and preaching, circumcision which he had not, which rather he had done in previous years past as a Pharisee. The legalists were offended by the preaching of the cross. And he points out that this is why the legalists are mad. It's because they are saying the circumcision, or rather he is saying the circumcision is not required for a relationship with God. And out of all of this, I'll tell you how it's applicable to us. Because we see the final consequence is in these seri- that's in these series of verses, is Paul becomes so frustrated. Frustrated is not a, a strong enough term. He becomes so agitated. Actually, I don't know if agitated is a, a good enough word. He becomes so infuriated by what's taking place here that he says he wished that the legalists would just castrate themselves, much like the pagan priests in Asia Minor. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a, that's a pretty stiff statement. That is how upset he is with these people who are relying upon themselves and not relying upon Christ. These people who are going throughout the church and saying, you know what, relying upon Christ is the wrong way. We need to go back to the law. We need to go back to sticking to dietary law. We need to go back to the sacrificial system. That's how upset he is. When's the last time you've been upset because someone doesn't follow Jesus Christ? Now understand, I'm not telling you to go out and wish castration upon any person. Let it be marked by the Joey. Put a note on this video. But what I am saying is, guys, is we should be passionate about the purity of this. We understand that we're never going to be sinless this side of eternity. But what we should be passionate about, and what we should be as pure as we possibly can be about, is the fact that our reliance is not upon anything or anyone else but the Lord Jesus Christ. See, these people in the church of Galatia that were riling everybody up, Paul was upset because they were polluting and they were damaging the Galatians' faith. You see, the legalists were putting their trust in themselves and neglecting to rely upon Christ. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, God's Word tells us this, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath He quickened together with Him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Now, if you don't get anything else from the verses, here's the four things that you should get. All trespasses, nailing it to the cross. Everything that we have done and continue to do to offend God was nailed to that cross. Amen? You guys don't seem too happy about this. The third point, I promise I'll be quick is if you put your faith in Jesus and recognize Him as your Lord, because we love a Savior, but so many of us don't love a Lord, then you have been freed from sin. Here's the last two verses. For brethren, you have been called into liberty. Only use 
I only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Because see, I knew some of you, by the way you were looking at me, or you were saying, Brother Danny, are you, are, are you preaching eternal security? Are you saying that no matter what I do, I'm going to stay, uh, I, I'm going to stay saved? No. Because if I were to stop right there in Galatians chapter 5, that's exactly what it would sound like. But we can't cherry pick the verses, amen? You see, we are not required to observe the law. And we do not have to worry about our own abilities to get us to heaven. Why? Because Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is all the payment that was required. However, that does not give us the right to go out and willfully sin. That does not give us a right to go out and abuse God's grace. Disregarding a life that is unbecoming of a follower of Jesus Christ is nothing more than a tragedy. And remember that little bit of leaven which leaveneth the whole lump? Well, a little bit of sin in a Christian's life to the unbeliever can cause them to never take the time to come to faith. The minute that we compromise anything in following Jesus Christ, we run the risk of not only polluting our own relationship with Jesus Christ, but we run the risk of causing that unbeliever to think we're no different and have no benefit because we follow God. So it's very important that we're not abusing the fact that Jesus Christ died for all sins. It is possible, brothers and sisters in Christ, to make a shipwreck of your faith. As a matter of fact, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19, it says, Holding faith in a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20 says this, For if they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. You see, a person who falls into self-reliance, and this can be categorized by trying to observe the law, placing higher importance on tradition, thinking there, there is something they can do to be righteous in themselves, much like sin itself, it all starts with a problem of the heart because the focus has been robbed from Jesus. Self-reliance is caused because the focus has been robbed away from Jesus. Radio personality Paul Harvey tells a story of how an Eskimo kills a wolf. Has anybody ever heard this before? Have you? Well, keep it to yourself. So what, so what, that, what an Eskimo does is they take their knife and they sharpen it as sharp as they can get it. And they coat that knife with blood. And then they stick it outside and they let it freeze. And then they bring it back in and they coat it with more blood. They stick it outside and they let it freeze. And they do that one more time. They bring that frozen knife back in, coat it with blood one more time, and they let it freeze. And then they go out and they stick that blade in the ground. Now, when a wolf follows his sensitive nose to the source of that scent, he discovers the bait and he begins to lick that knife. Tasting the fresh, frozen blood. And he begins to to lick faster, more and more vigorously, and, 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 and lapping the blade until the, the sharp edge has been exposed. Feverishly now, and, and harder and harder, the wolf continues to lick this blade that the wolf does not even notice that the razor-sharp sting of that naked blade is on his own tongue. Yet he continues to lick. And nor does that wolf recognize that that insatiable thirst is being satisfied by his own warm blood. His carnivorous appetite just craves more and more until dawn finds him dead because he has injured himself to the point to where he is bled out, all because he had a thirst for the blood that was on that blade. Dr. George Sweeting wrote in a sermon that it is a fearful thing that people can be consumed by their own lusts. Much like that wolf licking that razor-sharp blade, we 
constantly do things to mess up God's grace. Only God's grace keeps us from the wolf's fate. Now you say, isn't that a contradictory statement? We constantly do things to screw up God's grace, but only God's grace keeps us from the wolf's fate. Here is the difference. We must never try to take anything upon ourselves. Everything that we do, anything that we encounter, both good or bad, we should do and we should act only with counsel from God. If it's a problem, pray about it. Seek an answer in God's Word. If times are good, be thankful for it. Pray to God for it. Seek God's Word of how to continue. The difference between us and the wolf is the wolf, no matter how good things are, continues to go by his own senses until the point he's, he's injured himself and that injury becomes so bad it leads to death. The Christian follows their own understandings, their own comprehension, and relies upon themselves to do things which are right and things which are good. And eventually that leads on a path to destruction. There are some in here this morning that might have forgotten where true eternal freedom and liberty comes from. It's not from a government. It's not... Independence is not solely fixed on, and I'm talking about eternal liberty and freedom, is not fixed upon a document that was signed in 1776. It is from Christ alone. I'll tell you what, we'll close with that. I'll ask that you to close your eyes and bow your heads just for a moment. Here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm going to share one more thing with you with your eyes closed and heads bowed. If you haven't heard anything I've said to you this morning, I'm going to share something with you that I think will be a blessing to you. It's hard to believe how much trust one person can place into another individual. One way we recognize that or can see that is there was a gentleman who was able to tightrope walk across Niagara Falls. This gentleman by the name of Charles Blunden not only could tightrope walk across Niagara Falls, he could do it with someone on his back. And a huge crowd gathered to see him do this on August 19th, 1859. There were persons in the crowd that day who might have had their faith strengthened by the fact that on July 4th of that same year, this guy crossed the falls blindfolded, pushing a wheelbarrow before him. However, now the unknown man that was on Blauden's shoulders was the only one who was actually carried across. Why were there no others taken across? The answer is they did not commit themselves to the one person who could carry them over safely. And that man was Blauden, the one who was tightrope walking across the falls. And I share that with you because of this. Here is an illustration of a great biblical truth. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only one who can carry individuals from earth to heaven. The Apostle Peter declared as much, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. We see how it was necessary for that unknown man to commit himself absolutely to that tightrope walker. Likewise, sinners must actually commit themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ, depending upon Him alone to take them across the perilous figure of Niagara of sin and eternal death. This morning, it's my prayer that you lift your heart to the Lord Jesus and say to Him, Lord, I put my life into Your hands. Save me from earth's darkened cliffs and prepare me for heaven's shining shore. And by the way, this isn't just reserved for the unbeliever. This is also for the one who has faithfully followed him for so long, but there are still burdens you carried because you feel like you're just not stacking up. Because you just feel like you're not living good enough. Let's pray. Father God, I am thankful 
that there is nothing required upon me other than faith and trust to live, live this life and to cross over to heaven. Father, I'm thankful this morning for the Lord Jesus Christ who provides true liberty and freedom. Father, forgive me for the times when I feel as if I have to do something and do something right so that I stay within your grace. Father, forgive me for the times that I've undermined the work on the cross because I became more self-reliant upon myself. This morning, Father, I pray that if there are those this morning who are burdened by the fact that they feel like they're just not measuring up, Father, I pray that they recognize the grace that you have given them. And Father, I pray that we not abuse that grace. Father, I pray if there are those in here this morning that have been, that have allowed the fact that the blood of Christ covers all sin, that we've lived in a way that is reckless and abusive to your grace. I pray we ask forgiveness for that right now and put our faith back in Christ. And Father, I pray this morning if there's anyone in the house who does not know you, or Father, more so if they have never had a relationship with you, if they have never truly put their faith in Jesus. I pray this will be the day they do it. And it's in his name I pray these things. Amen.